gospel according to Luke, starting with chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. If you have it, say amen. All right, when you have it, say amen. So, of course, because the Israelites at this point are not their own, they do not have autonomy, and they are ruled by the Roman Empire, they also have to go to their, their home of origin. And so Joseph goes to the town of Bethlehem because he is from the line of David. This is significant in the Gospel of Matthew when they're doing the genealogy because it is believed, it was understood that the Messiah who would deliver the people of God would come from the line of David. So Luke, understanding how important this information is, wants to be clear that Joseph is returning to Bethlehem because he is of the line of David. But you know the story really well, right? Let's continue reading. It says in uh, verse 5, he, he went there to register with Mary, who had been pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child, right? Most of us, when we've heard this story and we've seen it, again, acted out, we have Mary about to give birth by the time they land in Bethlehem. Like, like, like Joseph just pulls up with the donkey, and Mary's like, oh, honey, Oh, honey, something's happening. And Joseph begins to panic and knock on doors and say, is, is there any room? Is there any room? While they were there, the Bible continues on, while they were there, the time had come for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no... Now, depending on what version you're reading, the King James says there, is, there was no room available, no room left. There was no room. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. Just imagine, transport yourself to first century Palestine, and just imagine a couple showing up, knocking on a door, and, and a frantic husband, soon-to-be father, says, my wife is about to give birth. Please, can, can we have shelter? And they look outside, they make sure they're not being pranked, and they say, sir, you're a stranger. We don't know you. Absolutely not. You cannot find shelter in our home. Find somewhere else. And, and Joseph then knocks on another home, and, and he gets the same response, and finally he shows up at a Motel 6, and the manager there says, oh, all my rooms, they're all filled. There's no vacancy. Can't you see the flashing lights? No vacancy. But, but there is a place in the corner of our garage. And you guys can do what you need to do. You can have a baby there. Now, in first century Palestine, this would never happen. In American culture, it's possible. Somebody can knock on your door and say, my wife is about to have a baby. Can we use your couch, some warm towels? It may possibly be a circumstance where someone says, I don't feel comfortable. I don't know who you are. But in most neighborhoods, someone would show compassion. Even in the most indifferent communities, someone would show compassion because there is something special about the birth of a child. People know how vulnerable the mother is. People know how precious life is. And yet we have given a picture that in this space, Joseph and Mary show up, they're about to have a baby, and everyone shuts their door. Now, this is where common sense has to play a part in our Bible study. We just read that everyone has to go home to their origin. Everyone had to go back to their hometown. That means that not only did Joseph have to go back to his hometown, but also Joseph's brothers, also Joseph's sisters if they were not married. That means that Joseph's grandparents, aunts and uncles, would also have to go back to the town of David. They had to go back to Bethlehem. You're trying to tell me that everyone shows up for the holidays and his own family's like, nah, bruh. Nah, nah, sorry, cousin Joseph. Nah, nah, it's going to get messy. We don't want you in our house. You actually think that Joseph would not have had shelter from his own kin So where do we get this idea that he's not allowed shelter during this space? It actually comes from early church fathers that wanted to paint a particular picture. Because you want to you know something, 
the rejection of Jesus sells. You know that, right? The rejection of Christ sells, not just the passion experience, but even his birth experience, to think that nobody wanted him, that there was no room for him, that there was no space for him, there was no love for him at the beginning of his life and barely any love for him at the end during that passion week. But I want us to look at a word that has been mistranslated, a word that unfortunately uh, in the King James it was was mistranslated, and the NIV, they, they do a better job, but I want to look at that, that word, for there was no more room in the inn. In the King James, no more room in the inn, the word there is kataluma, Greek word, kataluma. Now, kataluma actually means guest room. The NIV says there was no guest room available, but you have to understand that most of these Palestine homes didn't have two bedrooms. A lot of them were one-bedroom homes. If they had enough money, they could have a second room that was like a second story, but it's not like our second story, you know, with a restroom and a view. I mean, it was barely enough room for just a bed. And that's if you had money. But a lot of the homes were small and, and, and humble homes for, for, for people of not much means. And so the Bible says there was, a not, there was not enough room in the Cataluma, which is guest room, guest room. It is actually the same word that is used in the upper room in Luke chapter 22 when Jesus says, have a room prepared for me. It's Cataluma. Now, interesting enough, in the same gospel, the writer Luke actually gives us would hang out in a hostel. And that's what those ends were like. And that is the word, that is the word that Luke uses. The word means all receiving, meaning receiving everyone. So the Bible tells us, looking at the Greek, the Bible tells us that it's not an inn that Jesus was born in, or the stable of an inn. He, 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 was, he was born in a home that had a guest room. So this is probably the grandparents' house, maybe, you know? You know, because you know how grandma and granddad, they've been saving up money. They have, a, they have the upstairs. I remember that was one thing I loved about Christmas. We, get, we got to go to my grandparents' house in Vallejo, California, and they had a two-story home, and we thought it was a castle. We loved walking up those stairs. Oh, we loved walking up those stairs. If you had an upstairs, you know, loft or you had a second floor, we thought you were rich. So the Bible says there was no room, not in the inn, there was no more room in the Cataluma. There was no more room in the guest room. No more, the actual word, the room is there was no more space in the guest room. So Mary needed to do something, thinking on her feet to help protect her baby when she realized she was walking over relatives that I need to place my baby somewhere, and there's no more room, no more space available in the guest room. And all these cousins and aunts and uncles are all packed in there because when Jesus was born, especially in that culture, it was a family ordeal. No woman gave birth off in a corner somewhere. When, when you gave birth, you were around the women of the village. Even if they weren't blood-related, you were around them. And you want, me, you, want, you want me to let you know why this is even deeper? Not only is, is Joseph coming back home to his family, but Joseph is of the line of David, which means he's a part of the special family. The Jews believed that the Messiah would come through the line of David. So when people would say, yeah, I, uh, 
I belong to the line of David. Everybody, oh, Joseph, oh, the Davidic line. Every time a child was born in the Davidic line, people were like, mm, what's about to happen here? What's about to go down? They would treat them with even more care. They would treat them with more applause. They would treat them with more attention. So when Jesus is born, there's a buzz around the city. Here's another part in this story that we fail to pay attention to. Mary and Joseph didn't show up on the day of Jesus' birth. First of all, that would be irresponsible. I would remove Joseph as Jesus' father if he was that irresponsible. Not going to travel like, honey, you're about to give birth. Let's go on a two-week trek. <laughs> Ladies, you know how it is that final few weeks there. You don't want to move anywhere. So no, the Bible says that they got there with enough time, and it, and, it, and it says that while they were there, let's go back to chapter 2, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. In other words, Mary had a chance to kind of breathe, get to know her surroundings, meet her new in-laws, and say, Joseph, your mother is looking at me funny. She had time to meet the ladies in the city, and they all looked forward to the birth of Jesus. When Jesus was born, he was not born in some back alley. He was born in the warmth of a house family, friends, townsmen that cared and were celebrating his birth. Why is that important? Why is that a big deal? The Bible says there was no more room in, in the guest room, and that is why she put him in a manger. This is what a manger looks like. Most mangers, most mangers in these small Palestinian homes at the time, they were built into the floor. And the reason why they had mangers like this in the home is because they would bring their animals in at night so there would be no, uh, uh, they, were, they, they, would, they would protect their animals from thieves and from the cold. So they would bring them in during the night where there was warm shelter, and in, in the morning, early in the morning, they would let them out. In fact, this is one of the parables that Jesus teaches also in the gospel when they are complaining about Jesus healing that crippled woman, and he says, oh, um, and she was healed on the Sabbath. He says, many of you lead your animals out on the Sabbath. That's what he was referring to. You lead your animals out on the Sabbath because they have to let their animals go outside and drink water. But in most of these homes, they had a built-in manger, trough, in some, some in the ground, some actually into the wall. And you could see them. If you go even now to visit, you will see some of those homes that have built-in troughs, troughs in, in the walls and on the floor. But this would be a perfect place to put a baby because people aren't going to step on that, right? So Mary says, oh, there is no room here. Everybody has their sleeping bags everywhere. So I'm just going to place this baby in a manger. That's the manger. Pastor Henderson, what is the point of this? Why, why are you messing with the Christmas narrative? We like the drama of, of Joseph and Mary showing up at the very last second. We liked that there was no room left in the inn and everybody rejected them. We love the drama. The problem with the narrative is it's a narrative of rejection. It's a narrative of rejection, and many of us continue to adopt this narrative of rejection because it becomes fashionable to reject Christ. It really does. It's happened from the beginning all the way to the end. I mean, nobody really believes in him. Nobody really cares. Even his family doesn't like him. But this is not true. One of Jesus' closest followers was his brother James. Yes, even his own brother, the author of the letter of James, is not the apostle, it's the brother of Jesus. In Acts chapter 15, James is one of the strong church pillars who people looked up to, and that is the brother of Jesus. And listen, can I be honest with you? I mean, this may not be popular, but that brother was blood related. We always like to say that, 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 that Joseph had all these other kids because we too don't like the idea of Mary actually having more kids after Jesus. But the reality is that Jesus also had blood relatives. 
He was surrounded by grandparents. He was surrounded by cousins. He would eventually welcome in his baby sisters and brothers and so on and so forth. He went to kindergarten. He went to school. He went, he was like everyone else learning. Yes, 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 I know, I know, I know. I know Mary taught him. I, I know that Joseph taught him a lot as well. But Jesus had to also learn like you and I. This is why he can represent us. He knows what it's like to be human. He had family. The narrative of rejection is a narrative that we adopt because it actually makes us feel less guilty. Well, I mean, nobody really like is tight with him like that. Nobody really believes believes. Nobody really follows follows. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these situations where it almost is in vogue to reject Jesus. But I am going to, I am going to express this is that the Lord, our Lord and Savior, was accepted and loved. The Bible tells us in the, in, the, in the following verses that the angels then shared in song, they shared with the shepherds and told them about Jesus' birth and that the sign would be that you would find him swaddled and lying in a manger and the shepherds from all over showed up. I'm going to tell you that that night, Bethlehem partied. That night, Bethlehem was excited. The word started to get around to the point that eventually Herod would say, I've heard there's a king, a new king in Israel. The buzz about Jesus wasn't something that people were trying to keep quiet. There was something that God wanted the world to know. I have sent my son. I have sent Yeshua. I have sent the deliverer. I want everyone to know. I want the magi, the wealthy, the rich to know. I want the teachers of the law to know, and they knew. That's why they could tell Herod. I want the lowly shepherds to know. I want everyone in the world to know that I have drawn near. Jesus' birth wasn't a secret. Jesus' birth was beautiful. God was drawing near. But pastor, the Bible says there is no more room. I'm going to tell you that this, again, this vision, this narrative of the stable and Jesus in the backyard and someone's outhouse or whatever creates more and more distance between us and God. It puts his birth in a unique setting in some ways as remote from life as it had been born in Caesar's palace. Like it's that, it's that far off. Not seeing Jesus around his family and his, and, his, and his loved ones makes it almost obsolete. The message of the incarnation is that Jesus is one of us. He came to be what we are. He came to relate and connect with who we are. Jesus' birth was in a normal place. It took place in a normal, crowded, warm, welcoming Palestinian home, just like many other Jewish boys at the time. Jesus was one of us. The beautiful part of this story that makes me the most excited is it, it's not the narrative that there's no more room, it's that they make room for Jesus. They make room for Jesus. And Jesus has just a little small part of the room initially, right? It's just the manger. And can you imagine his cousins walking by and looking at him? Oh, he's so cute. Can I touch him? Do you have sanitizer? Yeah. Oh, look at him. He's so cute. They were tickling his toes. Jesus was learning how to walk around his family. And they gave him this little manger, this little place, this little tiny little place in the room with all of these people. But Jesus would eventually grow, and Jesus would start probably taking over the living room, right? You know how little kids are. Everything in the house is theirs. Mine, mine. Mine, mine. 
The story of Christmas is about there actually being room, and there's just a little bit of room, just a little bit of room initially, but it's a powerful lesson here. God doesn't need your entire living room right now. He doesn't even need your entire house. Give him just a little spot, a little space. Give him the manger in your heart for right now. Many of us will give up on the idea of really embracing this rejected God, this rejected king, because it doesn't seem fashionable. Many of us will give up also because it, we think it means that God is going to have to take over all of our life. God didn't ask to take over all of your life. He just wanted part of it, a special part of it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Christ is not trying to obliterate everything in your life. He wants to have a meaningful part of your life. And some of us right now are only at the place where we can give him room in a manger. We just give him that little spot, a little corner over there. Lord, I don't know if you can have the whole living room, not the whole entire guest room, but I'll give you a little space heater in my heart, just a little one to warm me up a little bit, just because I get a little cold, especially my toes at night. Just give you a little spot, and Christ will take it. He'll take whatever you're willing to give him. But beware that little baby grows. That little baby grows. That little baby grows and starts to move around. I remember when I first gave my heart to Jesus, I wasn't willing to give him everything. Not everything. Not everything. Initially, when I accept, accepted him into my heart, I, 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 I still wanted to embrace a lot of the things that I enjoyed that I thought were great. And I said, I don't know if I can give this up. I felt guilty to give it up, but I wasn't ready to give it up. And I'm telling you right now, allow Jesus to grow in your life. Don't expect him to be the king of kings initially. Sometimes before God can be king, before Jesus can be king, he has to be a little baby in your life. Baby Jesus just has to just, baby Jesus has to exist before the king of kings exists. And I started in increments. I said, all right, I'll give you a little bit. I'll give you a little bit. I'll just give you a little bit. Just a little bit, Jesus. I'll give you a little bit. And I started to notice as I gave him a little bit, more things started to change in my life. And without me even being aware of it all the time, I started giving him more. Because baby Jesus, he becomes a toddler. And toddler Jesus starts running around, and he becomes a young boy. He begins to grow and grow and grow, and one day he becomes your friend, and one day he becomes your teacher. One day he becomes your Lord, and one day he becomes your Savior. And one day he'll become your returning king. And I love this. The little space, the little space that they gave Jesus allowed him to have a bigger space in his ministry. Amen? Because of the space that they allowed for Jesus at the beginning of his life, he was able to have a greater space. And then he drops the hammer in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. He tells us, oh, because you gave me this space in my ministry, because you gave me this access to you, Peter, to James, to John, because you gave me this access, I will be able to have even a greater impact. The prophet Daniel prophesies in chapter 2 of his book that this rock that is cut from the, the, the mountain will then come and, and it, we look at it as pulverizing the nations, but I believe it impacts the nations. And Daniel 2 tells us that this rock, who we know is Jesus, begins to grow and grow until he fills the entire world. Oh, he starts off small, according to Daniel 2. He's like a little, tiny, little rock. But boy, that rock has power. That little baby rock begins to grow until it fills the entire worth. So in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is telling his disciples, greater things will you do than me. Because you've given me this space, because you've made room for me in your life, there will be an impact this world has never seen before. I believe the end comes, according to Matthew chapter 14, 14, not because of an earthquake, not because of a war, not because of a pope, not because of any kind of antichrist figure, boast. The end of the world comes when the gospel of this kingdom is preached into all the earth. That's Bible, right? That's not me making up. That's Bible. Until all the earth, that's when the end shall come, meaning we get to a place where there's absolutely no more space for the gospel. <laughs> it fills every single crevice, every single corner. There's now no more room. <laughs> and now God needs to make room, and Jesus comes. 
It's a different narrative, isn't it? No, the end comes, Pastor, when God's people are rejected and the message is rejected and the gospel is rejected. And, and that, no, that's not what Daniel 2 says. Daniel 2 says the rock fills the entire planet and no nation can stand. Matthew 14, I mean, Matthew 24, 14 says that the gospel of the kingdom will reach the ends of the earth and then and only then shall the end come. When we make room for Jesus, there will eventually be no room left for the enemy. Amen? He's the one that should be rejected, not Christ, the enemy. Cast him out. Revelation 14, 15, 16, I mean, John 14, 15, 16, and 17 says this repeatedly. It is now the time, it is now the kairos, another Greek word, the appointed time when the, when the ruler of this world will be cast out, when the enemy of this world will be cast out, when the prince of this world will be cast out. No more room left for the enemy, not for Jesus, but for the enemy. Because we've allowed Jesus a place in our heart, no matter how small it may be. Start somewhere. Just start somewhere. Start somewhere. But, Pastor, I'm not willing to give him everything. I'm not asking you to give him everything. Just give him the manger in your heart for right now. Just for right now. And let's just see what happens. So we'll close on this. John chapter 14. Turn there with me. Talking about room, <laughs> talking about catalumas, talking about the space. John 14, 1 through 3. This is what Jesus tells his disciples. You know this verse very well. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. I know the King James translates it as mansions. That sounds cool too. The rooms are as big as mansions. I'll go with that. But I love the fact that it's in my Father's house are many rooms because Jesus is saying, he's saying, I want you to live under my roof. I don't want you all the way over on the other side of town where I got to use Apple Maps to find you or Google Maps because it's better. No, no, you're in my house. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would not, I would not, uh, so if it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go, and he went, family, and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. Oh, because they made room for him. Because Jesus was surrounded not just by loving parents, but loving siblings, loving neighbors, loving community. Because he was able to talk to synagogue leaders. We know at 12 years old, they respected Christ enough to say, come on, young man, we're having a theological talk. Come and talk with us. They didn't hate Jesus. How could you hate him? He was such a beautiful boy. His character, his personality, people loved him. Before he ever performed a miracle, he, he was invited to a wedding. You know how serious that is when you're making the wedding list. And they said, we want Jesus and his disciples. They made room for him. And because they made room for him, he grew with favor, in favor with God and man, and they made room. And when Jesus had come to the last week, when he had come to the final night, while he was in the Cataluma, the upper room with his disciples, he tells them this, I am now going to make room for you. I'm preparing a place for you, and it's not going to be a little major. It's going to be a big room. It's going to be like a mansion, but we're going to be under the same roof. And I, I'm doing this so that I can be with you forever. And you can be with me forever. Isn't that beautiful, family? Are you willing to make room for Jesus? Just give him a small space for right now. That may be where you are right now. Just give him a corner in your room. Just give him, give him a space in your room right now. Open yourself up to connecting with God in an authentic way. Yes, there are some powerful, influential people that rejected Jesus, but not everyone rejected him. And for sure, you should not be one of them. Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. 
around a loving family. And Jesus looks forward to the day where he can be around his loving family, which includes you, and live happily ever after. Father, we thank you so much for this challenge. A narrative of rejection is not what you want us to adopt. It's a narrative of acceptance, a narrative of love, a narrative of family. That's what we want to experience here in this church. Rejection is in vogue for some reason. People want to feel slighted, want to feel like something is off and that people don't like them. I, I don't understand, Father, why the anger, the angst, all of that is so attractive. But right now, acceptance is what you're wanting us to embrace. Love and family is what you're wanting us to embrace. And so we make room for you. We make room for your gospel. We make room for your teachings. We make room for you, Jesus, in our lives. No matter how small of a part we were willing to trust you with right now, we know that relationship will grow. As we make room for you, Jesus, we know from your word that you're making room for us. Thank you. We can't wait to spend time in that special space with you. Thank you. We make room for you, Jesus. We make room.